Good morning. Well, this is a day that the Lord has made, and we will rejoice and be glad in it. And the reason for this season is a great reason to rejoice. <clears throat> Part the herald angels sing, glory to the newborn King, peace on earth and mercy mild. God and sinners reconciled. Joyful are the nations wide. Join the triumph of the sky. When the day of the Christ is born in Bethlehem. Hark the herald angels sing. Glory to the
Lord, we just praise you and give you glory for this day. And Lord, we thank you for this upcoming celebration of the birth of your son. Lord, you gave him for us to sacrifice his life for our, for our sins. And the love that you show for us is incredible, Lord. So we give you praise and glory in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you much. Uh, you may be seated for a moment as we uh, do the reading and then the lighting of the third candle of Advent. The third candle of Advent, first off, Advent is a very ancient Christian celebration. It's a preparation of the hearts and the spirit and the mind to prepare us for receiving once again the Son of God into the world and into our lives as well. The third candle of Advent is the shepherd's candle. It's also the one that has the unique color and is rose-colored. It is named in honor of the shepherds who were out watching their flocks by night. And in the providence of God, they themselves were selected to receive a very special visitation from angels announcing the birth of the Messiah, an announcement that was not given to those in political power or of social standing, but instead simple shepherds. The Gospel of Luke records the event like this. In the same region there were shepherds out in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. An angel of the Lord appeared to them. The glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were filled with great fear. And the angel said to them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, who is Christ the Lord. And this will be a sign for you. You will find a baby wrapped in swaddling cloths and lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest and on earth peace among those with whom he is pleased. When the angels went away from them into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, Let's go over to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened which the Lord has made known to us. And they went with haste and found Mary and Joseph and the baby lying in a manger. And when they saw it, they made known the saying that had been told to them concerning the child. And all who heard it wondered at what the shepherds told them. But Mary treasured up these things, pondering them in her heart. And the shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all they had heard and seen as had been told to them. Shepherds were such an unusual choice to receive such a divine privilege. Socially, they were among the lowest class in Israel. The religious leaders considered them unclean because of their occupation and their lifestyle. Their testimony was inadmissible in a court of law because they were considered untrustworthy. Their social reputation was that of being dirty, dishonest, and scoundrels. They were classified as social outcasts. On the other hand, what is a more perfect audience to receive the good news of great joy that will be for all people, regardless of the stigmas and the divisions, social divisions in society, the good news is for all. In John chapter 10, verse 11, Jesus says, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. And that's just what Jesus did for us on the cross. For the hope that we have in Jesus, the hope given to those shepherds so long ago, we light the third candle of Advent to prepare our hearts for the joy at the coming of the Lord. And also I wanted to say a very special welcome to those who are joining with us online today uh, on the live stream. We are so glad that you're a part of the Oak Park family. Remember, you can participate in today's service by texting in comments, questions, prayer praises, and prayer requests. And I want to give a very special hello to one of our dear members who's home recovering uh, from a broken leg, and that is a Shalane. Uh, hi, Shalane. We miss you. Hope you recover well. And uh, we're all praying for you, and we'll see you again real soon. Everybody say hi, Shalane. There you go. Very good. And uh, if you two are watching and we do not know your name, we would love to know your name so we can embarrass you online as well. <laughs> so go ahead and text that, text that in as well, 805-481-7092. Now, would you please stand for the reading of God's Word for our message this morning. 
As we are wrapping up this year, we've done an entire year's study in the life and ministry of Jesus. Last week, we came to his resurrection, his return to life after death, and the, it's the most significant event in all of human history. But the story does not end there. There is more. So we take up the next step in the next phase. From the New Testament book of Acts, the Acts of the Apostles, chapter 1, verses 1 through 11, Luke writes to us, in my former book, Theophilus, I wrote about all that Jesus began to do and teach until the day he was taken up to heaven. After giving instructions through the Holy Spirit to the apostles he had chosen, after his suffering, he presented himself to them and gave many convincing proofs that he was alive. He appeared to them over a period of 40 days and spoke about the kingdom of God. On one occasion, while he was eating with them, he gave them this command, do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift my father promised, which you have heard me speak about. For John baptized with water, but in a few days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. Then they gathered around him and asked him, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom to Israel? He said to them, it is not for you to know the times or dates the Father has set by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in Judea and Samaria to the ends of the earth. And after this, he was taken up before their very eyes, and a cloud hid him from their sight. They were looking intently up into the sky as he was going when suddenly two men dressed in white stood beside them. Men of Galilee, they said, why do you stand here looking into the sky? This same Jesus who has been taken from you into heaven will come back to you the same way you have seen him go into heaven. Father God, may you honor the reading of your word today with hearing, with understanding, Lord, with application. Lord, may we take the final commands, the final commission that Jesus has given us, and may we live it out as it has been so faithfully lived out in the centuries before us. Father God, I ask for the work of your Holy Spirit today for those who are gathered here in these moments, in this place, that you would work to bring the truth of your word, the conviction of, of, of your spirit, Lord, the commission of a life lived for you fully to bear in our hearts and our minds today. For those watching online who are not physically present, but they are united with us in spirit, Lord, we know your spirit will work on them as well. And Lord, for those who even watch at a later date, I pray that your work will be done in their lives as well. Lord, at this time of year, we're so easily distracted and sometimes even overwhelmed with the things of life and obligations and expectations. Lord, I pray for a few moments of relief from those things and a few moments to simply, solely focus on you, what you have done for us, what we receive from you, and Lord, what we can do for you in return as we live out a life of your love for us. As always, Lord God, I ask for my words not to get in the way of your word, but for you to work, to speak, to bring glory to yourself as Jesus is lifted up. And it's in the name of Jesus, our Savior, our Lord, your Son, O Father God, that we do pray and ask these things. Amen. You may be seated. So Jesus comes to earth. He lives a life. He gathers disciples. He teaches. He heals. He preaches. He is arrested, he is convicted, he is tortured, he is executed by crucifixion on a cross, and then he raises from the dead. That is the core essence of the message of Jesus. Anything that leaves any of those parts out is incomplete. We cannot focus solely on Jesus as a teacher or on a healer on a social or societal rabble rouser or anything else, we can only look at him as one sent on a mission to be savior. 
And at this time of year, it's so easy to focus on the baby in the manger and all the, the joy and the, the hope, the happiness, the innocence, the beauty that that represents. Yes, God came to us in human form, but Jesus came as a, as a child born with a purpose. He became a man on a mission, and that mission was to save God's people from themselves and their sin. The resurrection itself is remarkable enough, and it's overwhelming. It's, it's almost impossible to believe for so many those who have a low expectation or a low understanding of God, those who dispute historical evidences, they they will struggle with the resurrection. Personally, I have never, ever struggled with believing that Jesus rose from the dead. It's been a very simple thing for me to believe. Others, it's, it's insurmountable. I have struggled more, and honestly, my faith has struggled more, with John 3.16, for God so loved the world. That's the one I don't get. That's the one that's almost insurmountable to me because I see the news feeds. I am on social media. Pray for me. Um, but I'll be praying for you too. I, I, I see the world is so unlovable, but yet God loves. And he loves so much that he sent his son. The resurrection itself, I said, is impossible to believe for some, and it's such such an incredible, overwhelming, unnatural event, but it's real. And the more you consider it, the more you contemplate, the more you do a deep dive intellectually in the mind, but also in the heart. The resurrection is the only thing that makes sense in this world. It's the only thing that can be really real. And it's really real because it's almost too good to be true. God is. God loves. God gives. God sends. God forgives. It's overwhelming. The disciples of Jesus struggled with Jesus being alive again too. They weren't just these these easily swayed rubes who could be swindled and have the wool pulled over their eyes so easily. No, the scriptures are pretty clear. They had no idea what was going on. They didn't know how to process it. They too were dumbfounded. They too were in disbelief. Even after seeing Jesus alive after his death repeatedly, they still most likely were pinching themselves, having those quiet discussions. Was that really just Jesus who was here? We're not just seeing things, right? You know, we've, we've, had, we've, had, no, we've, we've had no sacramental wine yet this morning. We're not just seeing things or hearing things, right? This is really happening. How is this happening? How is this real? How is this real? The disciples have struggled as well. So Jesus keeps coming back to them. Over a period of 40 days, more than a month, there is no delusion, there is no hallucination, there is no fanciful imagination that would continue to recur and have this recur in their lives. And over the course of so many days and so many different individuals, Jesus met with the disciples, he gave them more instruction and deeper explanation. Jesus appeared to, in total, more than 500 people to show them that he was alive again. One of those was his very own younger half-brother, James, who did not believe his older brother was the Son of God, let alone God in the flesh. James was not a believer. But after the resurrection, James says, yes, my older brother is the son of God. He was dead. He is now alive. James becomes actually a pastor. He becomes a shepherd of God's people. He teaches people about his brother, Jesus. And he is eventually executed for his faith as well. 
These eyewitnesses, these 500 plus individuals are the ones who changed the world. The scriptures say they turned the world upside down because they implemented these instructions they got from Jesus. Because they were faithful 20 millennia ago, we are the legacy. We're the legacy of this scripture that we read where people saw Jesus and heard from Jesus and they just didn't keep it to themselves. They didn't just say, man, that's awesome. I am privileged, I am blessed, I am saved, I am good to go. Best of luck to the rest of you. They didn't say that. Thankfully, they were so compelled because their world was so turned upside down, their worldview was completely changed, they started telling people about Jesus. And the, the things they said about Jesus being alive again spoke to people's hearts that God is, that God loves, that God gives, God forgives, God redeems, God includes, God adopts, God accepts. It's almost too good to be true. Today we are sitting here because untold generations have taken their faith and they have shared it with others. I'm not sure how far back you can trace your spiritual lineage. I can only go back to the person who shared the gospel with me. I've lost track of him over the years. I have no idea what his spiritual story is, but I know that Jim Mitchell talked to me about the gospel. And the Holy Spirit activated his words and took root in my heart, and I believed, and I became a follower of Jesus. Sadly, I have no idea how Jim Mitchell became a follower of Jesus. And we have no idea how that person became a follower of Jesus, and the person before, and so on and so on, all the way back to the very first century. Jesus gave those witnesses a mission. It's called the Great Commission. All four of the Gospels that record the, the return of Jesus to life include in some form, some, some manner of saying that now that Jesus is alive, here's what you have to go do. Don't keep it to yourselves. Speak it out loud. Share it. Show it. Tell the world. Go to the world. I said it's called the Great Commission, and the most, the most concise, the most complete mission in print is in the book of Matthew. Jesus came to them and said, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. That right there shows that it is not the politicians who have the authority it is not even Satan who is the ruler of this present world and this present darkness. He is not the one with ultimate authority. Jesus himself, Jesus alone is the one with the ultimate authority. All authority on heaven and earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. Perfect timing. Man. <laughs> that is Jesus being with us right now. With the authority over cell phone calls and ringtones. Very majestic. I like it. Those of you at home are really missing out today, by the way. All right. No problem. It was good. You, you, you can't plan for that kind of stuff. You just roll with the punches. It's good stuff. That's not an excuse, Tim. <laughs> it's a great commission. Jesus gave those first disciples their marching orders. And those marching orders are not just for those original disciples and those original 500 who saw him alive. The command is self-perpetuating to every disciple in every generation 
And yes, includes us today as well. That is the one primary command for every believer in Jesus is to make disciples. That's the only command in the passage, by the way. Go, baptize, and teach. They're participles. They're not commands. The one command is make disciples. How do you make disciples? Well, as you're going in the world, Bring others on board. Bring others along in your journey with Jesus. And then baptize them. Bring them into community and incorporate them and teach them. Teach them the beautiful, wonderful, overwhelming, societally transforming truths that Jesus taught. Make disciples, by the way, is in no way coercion or force. Yes, sadly, throughout history, sometimes that's been enacted, and that is wrong. That violates not only the direct teaching of Scripture and the direct words of Jesus, it violates everything about the Spirit as well. Make disciples is uh, most, most perfect, more, more better translated, as you go, or as you're going into the world, it's passive. Make disciples means to cause someone to become a disciple or a follower of Jesus. It's about convincing intellectually because faith is rational. It's about encouraging the discouraged, the broken, the hurting by giving them hope. Not just wishful thinking, but actual, true, honest hope that enlivens and empowers. It's about attracting. It's about inviting. It's being winsome. The Apostle Peter, in his first letter, writes this, in your hearts, revere Christ as Lord. Because Christ has all authority. Jesus comes first. And when we are submitted to the lordship of Jesus, we belong to him, we serve him, we live for him, we represent him. And because we represent Jesus and Jesus is Lord, Peter writes this, always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope you have. But do this with gentleness and respect. Two words in short supply in modern American Christianity and our culture in general. Always be prepared to give an answer, to give a reason for the hope that you have. Your hope has to be not only visible, but it also has to be stated it has to be, become real, a real part of your vocabulary, a real part of your demeanor, your countenance, your day-to-day -day life. None of this doom and gloom and woe is me and the world's going to hell in a handbasket and, and how do we get off this ride? None of this, this woefulness stuff. Yeah, politics is crazy. Society is absolutely unhinged right now. You know, common sense isn't, it never has been, but it seems to be even in shorter supply today. But Jesus has all authority. The plan of God is still in place. The plan of God is still working. The kingdom of God is alive and it is thriving. The Spirit is not hindered or suppressed. The Spirit is alive and at work. The Word is still powerful, so be hopeful in a world of so much discouragement and despair, be hopeful because it itself will create interest and an opportunity for the gospel. But gentle and respectful is how we are to conduct ourselves. So what exactly is a disciple? It's sad that in our modern American expression of Christianity, in our modern American understanding of things and Western Christianity in general, we have, we have placed an emphasis on being a believer in Jesus. And that's true, you have to believe in Jesus. But we've made a believer in Jesus simply believing certain facts in order to be forgiven to go to heaven. That is not biblical. That is not scriptural. 
Biblically, a believer in Jesus is a disciple. A disciple is a student, it is a learner. It is someone who gives up their self-perceived autonomy because in reality we never are in charge of ourselves. It's an illusion. But it's a yielding of our autonomy to the authority of Jesus. That's what a disciple is. And we do that because we believe he died for our sins on the cross. And that's the the way of paying back God our debt of sin. We yield to the authority of Jesus because of the resurrection. He returned to life. He defeated our greatest enemy, our common enemy. And because he is victorious, we look to him for the path out of death, the way to eternal life. And we yield to his authority because he is currently reigning over all. A world in rebellion, a world fighting tooth and nail against his righteous reign. But we yield our autonomy to his authority. The word disciple simply means student, a learner, or follower. A disciple learns from Jesus both orthodoxy and orthopraxy. Big words, those are, your, those are your $10 words for the day. Orthodoxy, <clears throat> orthodoxy is simply this, right thinking. Right thinking about God, about the world, about Satan, about sin, about self, about eternity. Jesus transforms the way we think about these things. He gives us a new way to look at the world and a way to look at the self. And then orthopraxy is right practice. So Jesus gives us right belief and right practice. The right kind of practices in a world turned upside down, a way to love, to forgive, a way to pray and to worship, a way to have self-control, a way of generosity, a way of morality. Jesus himself said, if you hold to my teaching, then you really are my disciples. You will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. Free from what? Free from the lies of sin, Satan, and self. A disciple is one who is set free by the truth. Some key characteristics of a disciple. Excuse me. A disciple is a lover. A lover of God, a lover of one another, a lover of our neighbor, and yes, even a lover of enemies. It's a love in the name of Jesus, comma, by the way, not in your notes, comma, in the manner of Jesus. We look to Jesus to learn how to love because the scriptures say this is how we know what love is. Jesus Christ laid down his life for us, so we ought to lay down our lives for our brothers and sisters. Jesus said, a new command I give you, love one another as I have loved you, so you also must love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. The world is starving for the love of God. And at this current moment, the church in general, big C, all of God's people everywhere, This is not being lived out to the extent it's supposed to be lived out. Love is what this world needs, but it's God's love. Not the love of the world, the love of self, or love of pleasure, or anything like that. It's love directly from God. And Christians are to reflect that and offer it and display that into the world. A disciple is also a dyer, a dire to self, a dire to sin, a dire to the world. The ancient Christians, some of the earliest Christians came up with the, the, uh, the trifecta, so to speak. <clears throat> Excuse me. Our spiritual enemies are the world, the flesh, and the devil. And that continues to be the case, the three things we fight. By the way, there's a fantastic uh, book out. It's uh, fairly recent. It's by John Mark Comer, a fantastic author. It's a book called Live No Lies. And it's a manual for how to live in truth 
to combat the lies of the world, the flesh, and the devil. Fantastic book, highly recommend it. Jesus, when he called people into a discipling relationship with him, said this, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross daily and follow me. A disciple is also a producer of personal character, the transformation, the work of the Holy Spirit, the fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. But a public example, a public influence, we're a producer of making more disciples as well. Jesus said that the Father is glorified when we, as disciples, bear fruit. In John 15, 8. So how do disciples make disciples? Well, first off, be a disciple yourself. Not merely a believer. Not merely one who has made a decision for Jesus. Not merely one who attends church. Not merely one who calls themselves Christian simply as a label or as a moniker or as some kind of a designation, but instead one who truly believes in Jesus and lives for him and has devoted themselves to him and looks to him every day for how to live in this world. And as disciples, we are then to make disciples. That's our mission That's our purpose. That's our reason for existing. It is not to fill an auditorium or to gain numbers or to receive acclaim or influence or prestige or anything else. It is to help people become disciples of Jesus. That's the mission. The great news is spiritual rebirth is not dependent upon us. It's not about learning the right formula or a real or a specific prayer or knowing a few scriptures. It's not about just getting a few key answers or a key few arguments so that you can crush the opposition and convince them and, and somehow lead somebody to Jesus. Spiritual rebirth happens at the behest of the Spirit of God. God the Father draws. God the Spirit rebirths people who believe, who are called into fellowship. God is the one who does the work, but we get the privilege of being the ambassadors through whom God speaks to the world. You see, God uses our words, our stories, our our backgrounds, our strengths, our weaknesses to craft a message of influence into the lives of those that we are in relationship with. God uses our stories. We get to be his ambassadors carrying the most important message of all. As I said, the the only command in the Great Commission is to make disciples. The specifics of how we are to fulfill the mission is described with these three participles. Go, go to them, or as you go is a little bit more accurate. This means the process of making disciples is to be woven into the normal routines, rhythms, and responsibilities of life. It means when you are simply at home with a spouse or a roommate or children, that's the time to make disciples. When you were on the job site or when you're in the office, when you were on a work call or a work responsibility, that is the avenue, that is the opportunity to try to make disciples. It's influencing people to gain an appreciation of Jesus. It means when you're at Costco, prime opportunity to make disciples by not killing all the irritating people around you, by demonstrating the joy of Jesus. But it's the natural rhythms and routines. It's not for professional Christians. It's not for pastors. It's not for the super spiritual. Make disciples is the responsibility of every Christian, regardless of how much we may know or how much we may not know. If we love Jesus, if we are looking to him, if we are trying to live out his principles, then we are a disciple who can help make disciples because the Holy Spirit will use your best efforts 
and even your weakest efforts in the lives of others. By the way, the, 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 the phrasing all nations, it's not just political entities. The, the wording there is ethne, all ethnicities. It means all peoples. The gospel, the good news is for everyone, everywhere, always. Because we're one race, the human race, and Jesus died for the sins of all humans in the human race. Baptizing them. Baptism is a Christian initiation. It is a rite. It is an amazing, amazing visual demonstration of the gospel, Jesus dying for our sins, the fact that he was buried, the fact that he rose from the dead, it's how we unite our lives with that saving act of Jesus. Baptism is an act of invitation. It's inviting others to publicly confess their faith and demonstrate repentance because there's great power in confession when we take a stand for Jesus. Baptism is an initiation into a new life It is a spiritual rebirth that happens in that act. We're united with Christ and his saving power, and we are raised to a new life. It's integration into a new community. The community, the family of God, both far and wide and local as well. Disciples get baptized. That's why we practice believer's baptism. You have to be a disciple of Jesus before getting baptized. But if you are a disciple, if you love Jesus, believe in Jesus, you're looking to Jesus, you're desiring to live out your faith more, but you've not yet been baptized, get baptized. That's what disciples do. It's non-negotiable. It's part of the command, part of the commission. It's not ancillary, not optional. Baptizing them and teaching them. Teaching them is a present active participle. It means it's ongoing. Class is always in session. There is no final on this side of eternity. It means we never graduate. It means it's always ongoing. Discipleship is transformational, not solely informational. Jesus said, teach them to obey, not teach them scripture, not teach them to memorize, not teach them propositional truth. Do not teach theological argumentation. He says, teach them to obey, not just what to believe, but how to actually live it out, how to love, how to forgive, how to demonstrate mercy, how to have compassion how to love God and neighbor and one another and enemy and so much more. A disciple never stops learning and maturing. We never get it all together. We never arrive. We still need the work of the Word and the Holy Spirit no matter how mature we may be. And how can we give people cause to believe in Jesus. Well, Jesus himself said to pray. Pray for the opportunity, pray for the timing, pray for openness. The amazing thing is that if your heart is prepared through prayer, God will bring people into your lives or into your awareness of, 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 of people that he's already been working on. People may look like they've got it all together, but you have no idea what's going on behind the scenes. And if all of a sudden, if you're able to start praying and you're sensitive to the move of the Spirit and you're able to to say something about Jesus, you have no idea what that may unlock in that person's life. A person who needs hope, a person who needs forgiveness, a person who needs assurance, a person who needs truth. So pray, say, say your testimony, say the truth of the gospel. Put it into words. Speak it. Stay. Stay faithful. Stay persistent. Stay humble. Stay winsome. Remember, gentleness and respect. 
If you have some room on the notes, I ran out of room, so I wasn't able to include the last one, so you're gonna have to write it in there somewhere on your own, so make, make room for this one. It's pray, say, stay, display. You got your money's worth out of your pastor this week, right? Yeah. <laughs> display. Display joy. Display thankfulness. Display genuineness. Yes, and brokenness can be genuineness too. Even struggles with doubt or discouragement can open great conversations with those who need Jesus. But in spite of our struggles, our weaknesses, our victories, our failures, our defeats, whatever it may be, display hope. Hope that God still reigns, Jesus still wins. Display that hope. 2023 for our church family is going to be a year of renewed focus on making disciples. Being disciples who make disciples. Passing on our like precious faith to whomever and however we can. That's our mission. That's our call. I'd like to have uh, the team come back up and prepare us for a time of communion. Communion is a response, a response, it's a worshipful response to the presentation of the word of God. It brings us to Jesus, because that's where everything starts. Communion is where we take bread and we take juice. It represents the body of Jesus sacrificed for us. It represents the blood that was shed to cleanse us from sin. It is the body and the blood of Jesus sacrificed and resurrected that gives us life. And so we partake weekly to bring us, bring our hearts and our minds back to focusing on Jesus. Would you please stand as we sing? Use this time to pray, to meditate, to worship in song, to reflect. Communion is open to all who are followers of Jesus. At the conclusion of the song, simply come forward and pick up one of your element sets of communion. Return to your place. Stay standing, please, while we partake together. If you'd prefer to just receive uh, the elements from the back, you don't want to come forward, that's fine. Just raise your hand. They'll be delivered right to where you are. Let's sing. Holy Spirit, ring down. Ring.
forward to get you uh, communion elements. If you'd like someone to bring it to you, just raise your hand. Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me, in remembrance of Jesus taking our sin in his body on the cross, we partake. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me, in remembrance of a new relationship with God as Father through faith in God the Son, we partake. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. And in this act, we do proclaim our faith. We do so as individuals united by the blood of Jesus that saves us and calls us into eternal life together. If you are so willing, would you please proclaim and reaffirm your faith in Christ along with me by reciting the words on the screen. In the act of communion together, we affirm our faith in the crucifixion of Jesus for the forgiveness of our sins. Together, we affirm our faith in the resurrection of Jesus for the gift of eternal life. And together, we declare our shared abiding hope of eternity with our Lord, the Lord Jesus, amen. amen. You may be seated. And before Kevin and Christine come to do announcements, Mike, was it your birthday Friday? Oh, yeah. No. No, I think we're gonna sing again. Um, Fred or Susan, who wants to lead a song of happy birthday? Because my mic, my microphone needs to be turned off now. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday. Thank you. I know it's embarrassing when you're sitting out there, but when you're standing up here, it's twice as bad. <laughs> thank you, thank you. Good morning, Oak Park. <laughs> I'm Kevin, my lovely wife, Christine, and good morning, dearly beloved, we're gathered here today to listen to the announcements. Correct. Uh, yes, everyone, just a, a few announcements. Uh, thank you so much, first of all, for being here this morning. It's great to see everyone's lovely, smiling faces, and those online, too. Thank you for joining us as well. Brought to my attention, we need about six able-bodied young men to give us a hand. The canopy in the back parking lot has been turned over from the weather, so we could use some help with that. Also, again, happy birthday to 
song leader Mike today. We're so happy to have him and Susan leading the charge every other Sunday usually. As we all know, the weekly bulletin is digital. Also, is digital is the connection cards, praises, and requests. You'll all find those on the seat chair in front of you, the QR code. If you want to scan that, you'll find all that information available to you. And sermons, thank you to Paul. Sermons are now available on your favorite podcast app. Technology is our friend sometimes, sometimes. <laughs> this is one of them. First time guests, we're so grateful to have you here with us. And we do ask that if you would please fill out your, your, uh, your card and then take that to the Welcome Center in the foyer. And we have a small gift for you. Thank you for being here with us. And also that we will give, yes, we will give a donation to one of three different homeless agencies, as my beautiful Vanna White demonstrates. We will be giving to one of them in your honor. I have to thank you for being with us. One more item. No. Connection cards, yes, and giving. In the back of the room, by the exit doors, Thank you. Yes. We ask you'll put your, your donations, your giving, in those boxes in the envelope. Again, you'll find those in the seat backs in front of you. And finally, the other half of announcements, I get to my wife. Thank you. Please stop by the Welcome Center for ways to serve, especially Sunday mornings. Please stop by the generous table in the entryway for information on our annual Christmas emphasis on generosity before, beyond our four walls. Please check the displays or contact the church office for due dates. This Saturday, December 17th, B3, Bacon, Bible, and Brotherhood. From, <laughs> that's right, Tim. From 8 to 930 all men, high school age and older, are invited to enjoy this monthly wonderful gathering. Let us know you're coming by texting 805-481-7092. And next Sunday after service from 1130 to 1, we have the annual congregational meeting, which includes a yummy lunch. And Pastor Mike will be recapping all the wonderful highlights from 2022. And we're going to get a sneak peek peek at plans and goals for 2023, have a Q&A session, and vote on the elders for 2023. Offering. Offering boxes, again, are located on the back walls as you exit. <laughs> one on the left and one on the right. No. <laughs> Leave your offering connection cards or prayer praises and or requests in them, please. Now, if you'd please stand for our closing prayer and song. Thank you. Let's bow to our Lord in prayer, guys. Loving Heavenly Father, Lord, is such a wonderful gift of so many things in this life you give us, especially this first day of the week, us coming together to hear your word proclaimed. We thank you for the wonderful gift you've put, not just in Mike to give sermons to us, but the staff and the teachers and all the volunteers that are serving us here at this location. We thank you, Lord, for all those who get to listen online and all the different people who are helping this building in the rehab right now and the painting and just so much wonder that you put in our lives that we in turn count that as joy and we spread that love, that knowledge to others so we know that your word has been proclaimed that your kingdom grows. We are so grateful for all you do for us, Lord. Father, ask that once again you'll keep that joy. Let it be in our hearts. Let us spread that to others this week and that you'll let us come again to this place for all the times of learning and growth and fellowship that we have. In Christ's name, amen.
Blessed day.